at AIA Australia. We're making healthy living easier by incentivising your clients with rewards. Like discounts on their gym memberships, eligible flights and insurance premiums with AIA Vitality. It's no wonder that we've reduced client lapse rates by 50% and helped grow client engagement. To find out more, contact your AIA CDM today. Uh, Julian Plummer, uh, Managing Director of, of Midwinter Financial Services. Thank you, Julian, for, for making the time as well. Really, really appreciate it. No worries at all. Happy to be here. Delighted Thank to be you. here. Thank you. As, as are we, I think this session, we were just talking a little earlier, is, is uh, probably the most popular one we've had to date. Um, I think there was near on 100, 100 people, so let's hope Zoom can keep up with it. Go Zoom. <laughs> um, whilst we're just waiting for everybody to sign in, and I can see a lot of you already, I just wanted to say a big thank you to AIA who allow us to do this every week. Uh, a big thank you to, to them. And um, for everybody who's perhaps not part of the, the Facebook group, um, I'd ask that you jump on our uh, on our website. We have a, a Facebook group that there's a lot of interesting and, and wonderful discussions happening within that, all advisor to advisor. Um, so please, please make the time to, to jump on that. It doesn't cost anything and uh, there seems to be a lot of value. Um, we're, we're in the midst of organising a couple of events with um, um, a couple of fintech buyers at the moment and that, that will be held at, at a concessional price to those of you who are in the, the Facebook group. So, um, so I'd encourage you all to get on and uh, yeah, get across all of, all of that. One of the other things I'm, we're, we're currently working on is the uh, XY Advisor Mastermind. So a lot of our um, community members are perhaps in, in uh, awkward areas to get to capital cities. So for, for Sydney, quite, quite a few in Central Coast and Wollongong. What we're putting together is a structure where we can have roundtable discussions in these areas with, with young like-minded advisors. The response to that has been overwhelming. So um, I think this is going to be an Australian-wide thing. The rollout is uh, only weeks away, if, if that. So uh, keep, keep an eye open for that. I think we've also got a, a link. Thank you, Jackie, to the, the mastermind. So if you haven't done that, I'd encourage you to do so. Again, advisors to advisors, you know, share what you're doing in the business, hear what other people are doing in theirs. Uh, the topic for today, big data. Um, it's something that I'm probably personally quite passionate about um, on a on a general basis. I've, you know, it's it's almost like Internet 2.0 in in my um, small understanding, I guess. Uh, the ability to change behaviour and and so much happening behind the scenes, um, of which I'm I'm only scratching the surface. And that's uh, that's why we've asked Julian to to come along and uh, and talk to us all about. Uh, what is big data? What does it do? Does it actually influence or, or change what we're actually doing? Um, and we'll probably finish off understanding exactly what big data does in a financial services context. So, so with that, Julian, I might might ask you to to introduce yourself and um, yeah, start to open the door on, on big data. Absolutely. Well, thank you again. I think we we'll just take a few moments to uh, to reflect that today is May the fourth, and it's a day long remembered. It has seen the end of Kenobi and will soon see the end of the rebellion. So uh, we can reflect and ponder upon that a little bit later on. <laughs> but uh, big data. So you hear a lot about big data and uh, it is extremely large data sets that can be analyzed to reveal patterns and trends. Now, big data is generally data that is too big to fit in traditional analytical tools. So you wouldn't expect to be able to load up a big data data set within Excel or um, SQL uh, by Microsoft. Uh, you need special tools like Hadoop to be able to analyze the, uh, the, the time series that uh, Big Data provides us. So it's especially beneficial for financial, financial services firms, banks and customers and allows us to gain insight um, into their behavior that isn't obvious um, just by thinking about the behavior beforehand. So it's empirical, we're using real data and it helps us reevaluate, change and adapt uh, our, our, our understandings of, of how our customers work. So, I will give you a, uh, a few examples of big data and the earliest known big data example I could find was actually uh, 1854. It was, uh, it was the summer of 1854. It wasn't the greatest year if you're living in London because uh, they had a particularly nasty case of cholera. And uh, cholera, for those who are not too familiar with it, and I certainly hope you aren't, back then it was, it was, uh, it was believed to be caused by something called miasma and miasma is is uh, dirty air. So they thought that people were breathing in dirty air and coming down with cholera. And so uh, one physician who has gone down in history as a genius, uh, John Snow, 
thought otherwise. He thought it was uh, through water, and uh, no one believed the word he was saying. So what he did is he plotted all the outbreaks on a map, and then he plotted all the uh, all the um, the water pumps in accordance to where they were against the outbreaks. And he was able to track the contaminated water back to one specific pump, one specific water pump. Now, the only way he found that out was through data. There was no emotion, there was no bias, it was just that the data spoke for itself. And it was from that insight that uh, they were then able to reduce the amount of cholera within London. So if that's not an example of big data, you know, having a major impact on, on the outcome of uh, on people's lives, and then uh, I don't know what is. So that's certainly uh, a very interesting case. The second interesting case is uh, everyone's favourite friend, Richard Benson, Branson. So he was sitting on the side of the street in another summer London day uh, without the cholera, and uh, he was sitting on, sitting on the side of the road with his best mate, and he was looking at the number of cars and people that were going by the road. And... And they were taking bets on which way the, 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 the traffic was walking, the, 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 the um, pedestrian traffic was walking, which direction it was going. And what they found out after sitting outside this bus stop for a whole week is that the, the, pop, the, the pedestrians were moving in the opposite direction to which they thought they were. In fact, they were taking a bus on the opposite side of the road, getting off the bus and then going in the opposite direction on the other side. And it was based on that observation that they determined the first location of the Virgin Megastore. And it was a fantastic way to figure out where to start marketing to your clients and was the first example of real context-based marketing and location-based marketing. So that's another great one. The, uh, the sad story that, uh, that uh, we're all coming to terms with today is the poor sad story of Cassandra Sainsbury. Now for all of those keen students who are following her particularly sad plight of being caught in a foreign country with, uh, with a bag of contraband, how on earth did this girl get picked up? And it turned out to be a last minute purchase of a plane ticket from Hong Kong Bought by her, bought by one of her friends for an Adelaide woman that was set going to Columbia from London. Uh, now this set up a red flag in a database. Now can you imagine the amount of data that this this AI system had to comb through to find that exact specific situation? And someone in America emailed someone in London saying, "I think you should stop this girl and have have a look at her." And so she was stopped through customs and and uh, and those the contraband very quickly found. Now. It is quite scary uh, how how easily flagged she was, and it was based on the unusual set of circumstances that she found herself in, and, and it was that correlation of information that was so quickly determined. I mean, it happened almost within a day, almost in within real time. So uh, that's another way that big data is uh, really in the lives. So it's, it's it's quite effective when it's when it's used quite well. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll go through a bit more of big data, but first I'll do a little bit of buzzword bingo because I'm going to throw out some acronyms, initial in, in, initialisms and terms out there, and I, I just want to make sure everyone's on the same page. So you've got big data, which is extremely large, large data sets, two more traditional uh, tools like Excel or SQL. Then within that, you've got fast data. Now, fast data is data whose utility is going to decline over time quickly. So it's like... Twitter feeds, streaming data, these, this is bits of data that needs to be analysed very quickly. And so you have high frequency trading based on those bits of data or you have conducting algorithmic searches or, or those sort of things. So you've got to act quickly, you've got to ingest it quickly and you've got to prepare it quickly with fast data. At the opposite end of the spectrum, you've got something called slow data. Now that's data that trickles in. That might be something like end of year, financial end of year returns for asset classes, whereas fast data will be every single trade that happens on the ASX in real time. Now in three years time, the trade that went down at 2.09 p.m. on a BHP isn't as, isn't as important as the financial year end expected uh, uh, actual return of BHP. So you have fast data and slow data, and, and you've got to make sure that you apply them both correctly. Then you have small data, which is obviously the opposite of big data. That is something that will fit on your laptop, something that will fit on Excel. Now, financial planners are quite used to small data, I think, and they've been flirting with big data for quite some time. If you look at your reset, research uh, team within the licensees that you are in, they will all have access to big data. That's huge amounts of data sets of every single financial instrument that's listed on the ASX, maybe even the New York Stock Exchange. You've got asset, asset class data going all the way back to 1969 on some of those, and you've got bond returns coming, I think, from 1981. So it's with those data sets that we're able to look at things like expected returns and make predictions for the future. And I think uh, financial planners are in a good position because I think they're used to the concept of data and data-led decisions and using it to be able to make some sort of 
judgment on what's going to happen in the future. Then you have something called dark data. And there's a lot of dark data around, and dark data is data that is typically underused. Is that similar to dark matter? Uh, very similar to dark matter, except it's completely different. Uh, okay. Dark matter is uh, stuff, let's say you've got a shared drive that hasn't been used in, in about three years, and you've got a whole lot of legacy data there, and no one, everyone's too scared to touch it. And I, I'm sure every practice has something like this. That's dark yeah. matter, and, and some of it has a lot of information, so we need to get tools to be able to read the information, scan it, and then structure it. You have then dirty data, so which is a data set before it, get, before it gets cleaned up. So before you start using big data, it also uh, pays dividends to be able to clean that up. Another term you hear a lot about, in fact, I'm hearing it three times a day, and, uh, and, and, and uh, it's certainly coming up trumps, is something called a data lake. So there's two sorts of, there are two types of, uh, of data. There's structured and unstructured. So structured data is something in a, in a database. There is a, a relational there is a relationship between one data set and another data set, and it's, and it's all been cleaned up, and it's something like an SQL database. There's a data warehouse where you have raw data that's been unprocessed. So when you processed the raw data from the warehouse, you can then put it into the lake. Uh, and so there's those two, uh, those two, um, those two uh, concepts there. So you hear a lot about data lakes, and data lakes are typically uh, within an organization. Uh, so you, there's, they're not normally public um, public. Well, you see a lot of, you see, well, the one industry I think is benefiting quite well from uh, big data is life insurance. Uh, they're able to come up with new perspectives because they have access to more informa information about customers. They're able to start looking at their purchasing habits and lifestyles. They're able to think how to structure their products and when people are likely to buy insurance. And is this the actuaries looking at that stuff from a pricing perspective or is it uh, the, the product guys? No, I think it's the actuaries within the product teams are the ones that will be doing this. Uh, so there's some very smart people there, and, and we're getting to the point where in the United States you're getting personalised premiums. So what? Personalised premium because they, they've got access to that person's Fitbit and they're able to understand what sort of lifestyle they're leading and, and, and so on and so forth. So you're starting to get very personalised product offerings for specific people's circumstances. And so and, and automatic underwriting as well, does that fall in there? Uh, I don't, I don't oh, know sorry, too much sorry, Not so much automatic, but just, um, I should say, non non-person based underwriting so this whole technology underwriting yeah i think it definitely speeds it up without a doubt and you have something in the states called dynamic pricing of insurance products and something called pay as you live models so they're insurance products that are set up for the way that you live and so that's something that uh, i think is going to be certainly a big boon for for insurance and something that advisors have to come to terms with when um when, when recommending these products so there's a good there's a big opportunity between uh, collaboration between life insurance companies and, and the customers and as long as the customer gives the insurance insurer permission to be able to access this, that data, it could open up uh, uh, certainly big big opportunities for those insurance companies to be able to align the cost of the premium with the actual customer's lifestyle. And just practically with the access to the information, would that mean that I give the insurer um, bank statements or are they, are they recognising that Ray is um, the ANZ customer that's also the advisor that plays soccer and that there's something going on that's joining all this stuff up behind the scenes? There would have to be some something joining joining up behind the scenes. So you clearly you log into a, a portal and then you would sit there and connect your Fitbit, you connect your Twitter, you connect your, your Facebook, that sort of thing. And then from those feeds, I'll be able to determine what sort of lifestyle you lead. And uh, exactly right. And in your, even to the GPS locations of your phone, how quickly you're driving your car, all that sort of stuff is uh, is is it's that's the sort of da that's the sort of data you, you tend to see in big data. It, when when you look at one of those time series or one of those data sets by itself, there's not a lot of information in it. But when you stick it together with a few other data sets and you see the relationship between one data set and the other, that's where you begin to get your your value and understanding how things move um, in accordance with each other, uh, particularly mm. for um, for 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 uh, for, um, for clients. Okay. So, I mean, the other big thing is fraud detection. So, you, you look at people who get caught for insider trading, and and there's a huge amount of information out there that that the regulator will go through and sift through. And, they, and it's just like that that girl get caught up in the overseas countries. Uh, the red flags are produced based on huge amounts of data, and I I think that, that intelligence that the the regulators use to find those specific situations are only going to improve. And they're only going to get quicker, and it will be in real time. So they'll be sitting there managing the Australia's financial system in real time with big data, which will be uh, 
I think, well, it, it should lead less, less, to less fraud and hopefully uh, insurance premiums coming down. Uh, the other, the other yeah. one that's being used is personalised marketing. So that's where you, we've moved away from brand marketing where you concentrate on the brand of a company and then you're moving into contextual marketing where you specifically market to that person and to that person alone. Uh, and so you have very sophisticated algorithms, predicted, predicted targeting through uh, data collection, which um, is certainly, uh, certainly a boon for that, uh, for that sort of industry. This is, and that, that would be things like me um, Googling to get tickets to the A-League Grand Final this weekend and every time on an eBay or Gumtree or on Google, there's, there's all this, these ads talking about football tickets. Absolutely. And, and even like when you walk into a store, uh, let's say you walk into H&M and all of a sudden you get a text message from H&M, now how do they know that you were there? So somehow they're, they're hooking into your phone and your GPS, they know where you are, you've hit a certain a certain access point, and they're able to market you straight away, saying, "Have you checked out the men's section? We've got a, we've got a." Is this sale on. dangerous? Is this is this scary? I mean, I like if you're, if you're a business and you've got a commercial agenda, I, I can't imagine the regulators are as over this as the the quants who are you know ripping mm. through this stuff. Classic. I think one of those things that sound like a really good idea at the time when you're sitting in an office, but when you're walking to H and M and all of a sudden you're getting a text message about um, about winter coats from um, the, the next floor up, you start to get slightly creeped out by that. And so I think there's a trade-off between being too creepy and uh, and and, um, and and using big data to uh, certainly personalise those things. So there's an optimal in-between position, I think. Mm. Uh, and and is it your sense that that there are regulators look at? Is, is there, you know, is the government sort of express any concern? I imagine the US are probably better at this stuff than us, like most things technology. Yeah, there has been a backlash in the United States, particularly about that. And I think uh, there was one incident with Google where, where Google was doing something very similar. And, and, and I, I, don't, I don't recall the, the specific details, but I think they pulled that back because they realised they went too far. Uh, okay. So I think certainly you look, I would look to the United States for the groundbreaking cases on how people react to this. I think uh, certainly they have uh, a lead on everyone else when it comes to all things tech and, uh, and, and technology. Cool. Um, trying to improve people's lives. And as a, you know, getting, getting more specific, I suppose, to Finn Services and, and for yourself, so mid, midwinter, for those of you that, that aren't aware of the business, are a, a, a CRM with a, with a modelling tool that does insurance comparisons and uh, um, is, is a real, real helpful way for advisors basically to, to hold client data through to, to SOA production. What, what sort of stuff are you seeing? Or what's big data allowing you as a, as a you know, as a, Product provider um, of, a, of a in services software in terms of you know what what you're seeing in behaviours and product development you know what, what how how's this changing you know my life as an advisor when I go to work on Monday? Mm -hmm. Well, we're spending more time on on reporting. So it used to be we spent all our time on SOA generation and modelling and, and those sort of things. Now we're spending we, you know we've got dedicated teams that do reporting. And what we've done is we've opened up our API to access all those reports. And uh, we're working with a company called Frisk. And Frisk is big data enterprise search, and we've been working quite closely with them. And I've been stunned at the at, at, at the use case that they've been able to to get out of our API and 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 a number of other data providers. So what they do is they do enterprise search, where you think about your practice and you think about all the emails you have on your exchange and that you don't have access to other people's emails. You have V drives, you had X drives, you have information in databases, you have information in device OS, and it's everywhere. You've got eight different versions of SOWs that are going out. You might have five different versions of SOAs going out. You can't remember which one's the final. And so you have that overwhelming amount of data that, that um, practices have. And a lot of it's legacy because you have to keep it for seven years. Now, what you want to do is you want to turn that static data into something that's meaningful. And so what we're able to do is uh, index your entire organization's data. It's like an internal Google for your organization. It will go through and scan all that and index it. And we've allowed them access, and that's assuming, of course, the advisor gives them access, uh, for their API to be able to scan our document storage and all the file notes and all the attachments within our database. So what you're able to do is load up your uh, internet or what some sort of tool, log into Frisk, and uh, do a search for, uh, give me all SOWs that don't have product replacement uh, uh, fee tables, but are about product replacement. So you're very able to scan your entire organization's uh, repository for SOAs and look for things that should have been there but aren't. And so it's, it's a major client, uh, compliance advantage when you're looking for information. You have to make sure that uh, you know, your, your 
meeting all your requirements uh, from a legislative point of view. So it, it has a huge amount of compliance benefits uh, and, and it also gives you corporate memory. So let's say that, uh, I mean, how many times you've gone into a bank or you rang up a bank and uh, you've requested them to do something and then you ring them up the next day and they've got no recollection or, or knowledge of you actually having asked to, to have done that. And then the next day you have another person ring you up trying to sell you a product in contradiction to what it is that you requested the day before. It's because the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing and you have this huge amount of data in the organization and it's just not aware of each other. So when it comes to something like Frisk, you'd, you'd be able to type in my name and type in every bit of advice Julian has got and see everything, whether it's in someone's emails and you have a, or, or, or it's on the Z drive or it's in, in another system completely in another, another division. And you have access to all that information and you're able to see all the interactions you've had with that customer and you don't let yourself get you in that position where um, you have someone saying, look, I wrote to you about this week, dear bank. Um, why haven't you done something about it? Stop calling me. So it, it's a very interesting case for giving yourself a good corporate memory. And that's memory that doesn't get lost between different bits of um, uh, different people within the organization, different departments in the organization. So I think that's certainly. Uh, I was just yep. going to say that I suppose the, the catch then or the, the, the caveat is that the, the corporate would need to have that data already, right? So you're, yep. you're used to looking at things that you've already got. Yep. Are, you, are you sort of seeing that there's, there's, you know, pathways being developed so that. You know, I could uh, potentially have a client, uh, uh, you know, a thing pop up on my CRM to say, hey, you've got a client who's checked his portfolio 45 times in the past 45 days, give him yep. a call, they're scared. Yep. Um, you know, is, is, that, is that, you know, sort of the behavioral stuff? Is that, you sort of seeing this stuff come through as well? Absolutely. So, I mean, a few years back, that will be the last bit of information we would have stuck in, in an integration project within an API. But it's those small bits of information and it's, how many times have done things? How many times have you checked things? We need to expose that information to a tool that can scan it and read it. So it's certainly something we're spending a lot more time on is, is just the more obscure stuff where people are trying to recheck things a lot of times and, and making sure that that information gets to the right places. Because, I mean, the regulators, they're on a data-driven drive lately. Uh, it used to be the case where they did things like uh, super switching shadow shopping and they would they would have a small sample, go through that and make predictions about what the population is doing. Now what you know is what is the entire population doing? I don't want to get, um, audit your practice and cherry pick the three best advisors. I want to move the survey sample to the entire population of your advisors and I want to do that in real time. So being able to do that is, is, is certainly, um, it would lead to more efficiencies within the regulation and hopefully make your, uh, your licensees and compliance costs less than they are now. So you want to be more, it allows you to be proactive in defending yourself against compliance. Um, yeah, that's one of the things that strikes me as an opportunity is this ability of anticipation. You know, is you know, as a, as an advisor, I'd like to think that at one day I'll have the technology that enables me to anticipate things before they even come up. So you know, based on the data, as a client comes in for their review meeting, I can say, you know, my I've, I've it, it, it's very reasonable for you to be experiencing these anxieties because everyone in your demographic or, or it's, it's it's common that your 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 people in, in similar situations are looking at this sort of stuff um and, and anticipate and off the back of that you can come up with financial strategies and, and discuss um you know is that is that is that a is that a, a hundred year old frame i i don't think that's that's uh, it's not beyond the wit of humanity to be able to provide that service and it's just simple yeah. stuff like you're sending out fds's and, and you guys must send out a large number of FDSs every every, uh, every time you, they're due. And in, in that FDS, you promise certain services. And how often have you gone off to check that you've actually provided all those services? So you need a system to be able to say, okay, this is what's in the FDS. Let's ensure that we have actually provided those services. Now, that's a simple thing to do, but I'm sure that you have a large number of FDSs and a certain number of them are going to be wrong. And so if you be able to quickly identify that, is it's a very quick win. Uh, and, and things like, uh, uh, have you, have you, have you, are there any F SOA sent out, but I haven't provided an FSG along with that SOA. It's just a simple search, find out those 10 that haven't, and, and let's make sure that they get that information timely. Yeah. Uh, and being proactive, and that, that allows you to spend more time thinking about the advice and thrashing out strategies with the, with the client instead of worrying about paperwork, things that haven't been filled out, and, uh, and that sort of uh, palaver. Hopefully that'll that'll result in things like uh, lower licensee fees because things yeah. are being automated and streamlined. So who knows? You know, maybe there's a tech provider on the on the sidelines looking at, at uh, offering licensing uh, to, yeah. to financial advisors. 
Absolutely, absolutely. There is a, a company in Silicon Valley called Splunk, S-P-L-U-N-K. Uh, and it is, I mean, it's a real eye-opening experience watching these guys in action. So Splunk was designed by a bloke who was running a large, a large US retailer. And, and it was an online retailer and their systems went down. And then you had the CEO rush into the CTO's office demanding an explanation. Why has this thing gone down? And the, the CTO turned around and said, look, all I know is it's down. I don't know why it's down. There's 50 things that have gone, good, could have gone wrong. It's going to take us a while to figure out what those things are. And he goes, well, you better hurry up because it's costing us $1.3 million a minute in lost revenue. Uh, and so you better get the problem quickly. And so he had a huge amount of data there. He had error messages from about 20 different systems. None of it made, I don't know if you've ever seen an error message before, but they're almost incomprehensible. They're written for programming and, uh, and, and, and you have to need a degree in forensic anthropology to understand what any of them <laughs> Let alone, it. <laughs> exactly. But then you've got, to, you've got to think about the entire system, how everything works with each other. So this system called Splunk scans mess error messages from all these different systems and looks for relationships. What, what happened first? What caused this other error? And so rather than understanding what the error messages mean, it looks for relationships between the error messages and allows you to pinpoint what is the root cause. And then you spend all your time looking at that one error message, which then once you fix it up, cascades across the rest of it. So Blunt was set up to manage large businesses in real time. So you think about the quarterly reports that you used to get, and you still do, I'm sure, uh, about statistics that happen within your organization or your practice. Uh, and they, they, they take a few weeks to be able to present, and by the time you get them, they're, they're out of date, and there's always caveats involved with the reporting. But what, they, what people want to do is they want to be able to get those reports in real time. And so with Splunk, you're, man, you're able to manage your business in real time, and, 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 and it, you lead to far better decisions because they're not based on biases or human emotions, they're based on data. And I think uh, running your business in real time is going to be certainly one of the great themes of the next 10 years. One of the one of the things uh, you touched on, and I'd be keen on exploring, um, you know, because I see quite a lot from a psychological perspective, is this idea of root cause analysis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's really easy for for me as an advisor or uh, you know for a practice manager to see 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 a problem and not necessarily uh, and 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 uh, and um, uh, address the problem rather than understand where that problem came from. So. Mm -hmm. You know, is, it, is it fair to say that something like big data, rather than just looking at, at the outcome of, of an issue, it actually trails through and says, well, actually, this was the embryonic form of that. So if you see that again, be wary, be wary of that. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So you should be able to learn from those mistakes as well. But uh, big data is very good at getting to the, the root cause analysis very quickly. Yeah. Right. Uh, I was telling Clayton the other day, I'm quite a keen student of the M Malaysian rubber industry. And, uh, and I've been watching that industry quite closely for a large number of years, and, and I, I seem to find myself getting into a lot of bets with people about the Malaysian rubber industry, particularly Malaysians, obviously, because they're all, always quite keen on it. And I remember being, having a bet with, a, with someone about 20 years ago, and the only answer to this bet was in a United Nations report that was written in Malaysia. Now, I remember, I, this was a university, I remember typing into the translator and getting a rather a pigeon in English response. It didn't make a lot of sense, but it was enough for me to win the bet, obviously. Uh, and so, I came across another person who I had a very similar bet with the other day, and I knew it was money in the bank, so I took it, and uh, and so I had to prove my point, and so I used Google Translate on the same sentence I translated 20 years ago at university, but the translation was perfect this time. Now, what's happened between now and 20 years ago in terms of translating uh, languages? Not much. I mean, we knew that we knew all the words in the Malaysian language, we knew all the words in the English language. The linguistics hasn't changed. No algorithm has really changed that greatly either. So what's happened though, to get from something that was kind of okay to almost perfect, is they're using big data to do the translation now. So what's happened is Google's gone off and got 100,000 Malaysian textbooks and books, and they've gone off and got the equivalent English books, and they've looked for relationships between the two data. They say, okay, when you have this word followed by a comma, followed by this word, it translates to this. But if you don't have the comma, and then it's got a capital letter after that, it seems to be translating to this word. So they're using large sets of data to compare the two languages and then look for correlations. And the head of uh, Google Translate said, every time they hire a professional linguist within that section of the company, the quality of the translation actually goes down. 
So it's just quants mathematicians that do all the translations now. There's no, they don't, they don't even understand the Malaysian language. They've got no idea what's going on, but they, they know that the mass doesn't change. So it's being able wow. to, it's, it's a huge benefit of, of, uh, of, of AI and also uh, and, and big data working together to come up with an almost perfect response without knowing anything about the subject matter at all. Uh, you see in uh, you know not too distant future shows and the like where we've got this little bug in our ear and you can be in the middle of China and someone's speaking yeah. to you in Chinese but you receive it as English and mm. you talk out in English and they receive it as Chinese. Pretty cool. Yes, that's certainly. I mean, probably bad for me because uh, they don't want to hear a word I say. But uh, <laughs> uh, certainly, uh, the Malaysians bagging out their rubber industry. <laughs> well, look, it's it's a very compelling industry, and I urge everyone to um, take more notice of what they're doing up there. <laughs> Um, one of the questions I got bringing bringing back to a, a Finn Services, <laughs> um, look, a young young advisor, you know, don't don't necessarily have the the backing, the financial backing of, of institutions, say mm. to to run down a whole bunch of rabbit holes and trawl yeah. through data and you know spend spend a fortune at you know one point three million dollars a minute. Mm. Um, you know what what what's available to me as an advisor to to allow to help big data make me a better advisor. I think it's a, it's a matter of watching this space for the smaller practices because big data does require a huge amount of upfront investment and you're getting disparate data sets all being put together and and first of all you need big data so I mean you have large amounts of information on your on your drives but you don't have you know the access to the internet of things or the, you know the, the the Fitbits and all the rest of it so I think the advisors are going to benefit from companies like ourselves working with with big data third parties for the larger banks and once we finish those projects what we're going to do is push them down to the rest of the advisor community and, and hopefully benefit from that so you'll have access to more off-the-shelf uh, um, through the API so the maturity of I mean everyone's got an API these days but not API all APIs are equal and you have some immature APIs and you have quite mature APIs and getting to the point where you're able to push that information out to these third parties takes a bit of uh, there, there is a risk with startups. With startups, the the number, the, the the only thing they're worried about with with particularly fintech startups is getting the next release out, and it's all about the next release, making sure that function is there, making sure that you know you, it's a it's a race, it's an arms race to get to a, to an endpoint. What's often forget often forgotten is the security that's needed around those functionalities, and so you have to make sure that when you're dealing with big data, you're dealing with reputable firms that are obsessed and paranoid about your data because if someone's to get a hold of that data it would be a business ending moment for for all for all uh, concerned so there has to be strict procedures and, and policies in place about that handling of data making sure where it's stored making sure it's encrypted hashed peppered and uh, and and, uh, and and making sure that it doesn't fall into the wrong hands because the last thing we want is big data in the hands of a black hat hatter hacker and uh, going on rallying you like we've seen with Netflix and the dark overlord in the last few days what what happened with Netflix? Uh, Orange is a new black. Someone hacked into their data data lake and uh, downloaded the latest or the season five of uh, Orange is a New Black, ah. and uh, and threatened threatened Netflix with a a uh, releasing them to uh, on, to the wild on a torrent if they didn't pay them um, a certain amount of money. Netflix uh, doesn't deal with terrorists, and <laughs> uh, and so they. Uh, so the Dark Overlord released them, and uh, and uh, apparently the quality is awful. So I don't condone any of this, by the way. It's an outrageous, an outrageous. Thing. So, uh, but you don't condone bad quality torrents. No, I do not. I do not. <laughs> I, think be, I think we should be very clear about that. No torrents at all, quite frankly. All right. Well, uh, mate, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, yeah. we're, we've got maybe ten minutes up our sleeve. Mm -hmm. uh, first question is: um, the last time. Um, someone named Julian became quite notorious with uh, computers. They ended up in an Ecuadorian embassy in London. Do you expect to follow that trend? Uh, more people named Julian or ending up in Ecuadorian prison? Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Look, uh, I, I certainly hope not. I abhor all, uh, all of that, to be quite frank. And uh, look, I think information wants to be free. Information wants to be free. So you got to... And it comes down to, to security. I mean, what happened with WikiLeaks and, and, and how they were able to get all that information out of the NSA and put it into the wild uh, is, is something to be frowned upon. You, you have only the, there are two things I, I often say: only the paranoid survive, and just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. And you have to have 
attitude when it comes to data. So we, we've got a huge database. With, I, I don't know how many, oh, I do know how many advisors, but I'd rather not say, with a large number of advisors, and we have medical records, we have TFNs, we have SROWs, we have med, uh, all sorts of your client information. And, and that has to be guarded, it has to be safeguarded, it has to be looked after. And it's mm. not something you, you, know, you, can, you can handle lightly. Uh, and so we're all, you've got to be security first and you've got to be paranoid. You've got, yep. to, you've, you've got to assume that people are trying to get it all the time. And so we, we, you know, we have a team of people here to look at nothing but uh, ensuring that da that data is safeguarded. So hopefully uh, no one will end up in any embassies, that's for sure. Okay, fantastic. Uh, my second... One. That'll be the last one. <laughs> uh, second question is, from an advisor point of view, compliance um, is, is a pain in the butt. Mm -hmm. um, you're saying if you're working with this company called Frisk, yep. so it's just to sort of get to, to Dylan's question, which is, you know, how, do, how does it affect the everyday uh, advisor? Um, mm -hmm. First of all, I just want to talk about compliance. And the second half of the question will be about attracting clients with big data. But first of all, compliance, um, how would compliance look from, uh, from a big data point of view? Yeah, so, I mean, you're looking for things, it's very easy to search for things that are there. It's not so easy to search for things that aren't there. How do you search for things that are missing? How do you search for SOWs that have got missing required tables? How do you search for SOWs that don't have the right authorizations? And it's, it's those searches that are very difficult. And how do you do it from multiple sources? And mm. being able to bring that all together in one quick search and be able to search for things that aren't there. Uh, so this is the ability to search for a product replacement paragraph without the words product replacement actually being in that SOW. It will scan right. the document say, look, this looks like an invoice, so I'm going to ignore this one, but this is an SOA. But where's the replacement section? Because you've, you've, you've spoken about switching platforms here. And yep. so it will help you look for things that you should be doing, but you've forgotten or it's been left out or that sort of thing. So that to me is, is, is a huge advantage for someone who's dealing with a lot of information about some quite complex SOAs that are, that are missing, um, missing bits of pieces. And also that, that contradicts itself. So it can, it can search for contradictory terms and it can look for awesome. It can look for forms that haven't been filled out correctly. Normally, right. we look for forms that have been filled out. Yep, that's fine. But what if it's been filled out incorrectly? And I think that's another one that uh, would certainly uh, certainly help. So in practice, uh, I, in my power planner writes uh, an SOA, mm -hmm. um, and I get a report that says, "Oh, actually, these are in real time before you even deliver it to the client." A couple yeah. of things that should be that should be at least be looked at, but are yeah. probably a problem. Which yeah. then, I guess, over time turns into perfect SOAs. Which then, I guess, over time reduces the need for that once a quarter or once every six months or annual compliance check, where someone comes in and checks four documents by hand. When mm -hmm. we've had uh, big data checking all of the documents a hundred percent of the time. Um, which then goes back to raise uh, about reducing um, dealer dealer cut. Which is, which is just winner, winner, chicken dinner for everyone. Uh, my final yeah. question is uh, a little bit more um, to Dylan's question, which is how do I use big data to attract clients, right? So uh, I now know how big data affects me for ongoing clients, but for new clients, how do I, uh, how do I know when someone is searching for X, Y, Z, uh, mm -hmm. which, you know, which leads into all these things. So these people are ready to purchase. So, you know, uh, financial advice, they're ready to take that step. How yeah. do I get in before Commonwealth Bank does to find that client to bring them on? Yeah, well, it, it, it's all through customer segmentation, I guess. So achieving and transforming customers from a prospect to a paid client, you need to understand your customers through segmentation. So big data and allows you to segment your customers into, into the right segments. And they can include daily transactions, interactions that you've had with them over online or you know through Twitter using external data. Uh, you can even hook it up to the value of their home. So you, you're able to promote to those people personally, but on a large scale. So it, it's a bit like having a conversation on Twitter, but on scale, but you're doing that on a very pers in a personal way using big data and information you get from big data. So, you know, it's all about your campaigns in that particular instance and understanding your, the customer behavior. So if you can build more accurate models of your customer behavior, you're able to set better prices for things like loans and financial products that optimize the products for them and it aligns the right products with the right customers. If you're giving the right product to the right customer or that's, that's your recommending, 
uh, then then you're halfway there, I think. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's one question here from Brett and that says, uh, is midwinter, so it's more of a, your product specific question, is midwinter looking to integrate clients' social media accounts with your OS file to make communicating yes. easier? Absolutely, 100%. And, 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 and that's always been a passion of mine, social media, and, and it's just you're able to get more of an idea of what your clients are up to and, and have a conversation again with everyone at scale. Uh, and it's all about scaling out your business. And, and, and you can't talk to a thousand people individually, but you can talk to them all at once and scale out your personality and build credibility that way. Uh, and I think social media is, is key. Uh, we, we, we actually did have uh, access to the LinkedIn uh, via API in the customer fact find. Uh, but at, at that time when we did it, the API from LinkedIn, it, it wasn't coming through cleanly. So I think that's gonna, we're going to have another crack at that. I would okay. certainly be able to fill as much of the fact find out from things like LinkedIn have the picture of, or a photo of the client there and it's just getting to know your client quickly seeing what they're up to seeing they've been on a holiday you know and, and no look they're talking about retirement he's just quit his job i better go yep. and give him a call because he needs to know that um i can help him transition to retirement appropriately great man cool awesome man i look couldn't thank you enough um you know for yeah. for us in fin services it is big you know big no idea what 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 big data is is one of those buzzwords. Um, so to have the opportunity to, to take the time with someone like yourself to talk through that, really, really appreciate it. And um, I'm sure you'll you'll happily make yourself available on that Facebook group if um, there's and there's any flow on questions, um, bits and pieces. I've seen people like Deloitte do some some interesting white papers on fin services and big data. So for those of you that are interested in exploring a bit further, um, perhaps perhaps that's a that's a starting point. But look, thank you very much to to Julian, Clayton, and and everyone who's who's taken the time. We really appreciate it. I um I won't be won't be long before next Thursday. We're we're here again and um and uh, and and talking to to the next uh, fin services specialist. So with that, I um I, I say goodbye and and thank you to everybody for for signing in. Thanks for having. Me. Thanks, Cheers. Julian. Goodbye. Cheers, everybody. Bye.